Let me start by asking you a very simple question, Nicole. Do you understand or do you know how much carbon that you consume every month for your home? No clue. So that is a problem that we're trying to solve. So there、mm. are a lot of people and businesses, governments who wants to solve the climate change problem, who wants to lower their emissions. But the first question that you ask is how much carbon that I'm actually emitting as a result of my consumption of electricity, for example, right? And that question seems very simple, and it seems very straightforward. But most of the time, like ninety nine percent of the time, you don't have an answer to that question in a very accurate way, in a robust way. Hey, welcome back to another Tactical Tuesdays or practical guides and insights into how you can accelerate the clean energy transition through very specific understanding of different elements. Subject matter experts come in and share. Their insights to some technical aspect to make you smarter. Thank you for showing up. That is what matters here because if we don't show up, we can't get work done. <laughs> One of the companies that I was most impressed by in 2023, and I'll say that by nature of their founder, whose episode back in February, about a year ago, really left an impression on me. That's a guy named Winbo Shi. Winbo runs a company called Singularity Energy, where they are really unpacking the data behind the emissions on our grid. Winbo's question is really simple: Can you track your carbon footprint? And how can any company claim to be reducing their carbon footprint if they aren't honest about the actual carbon footprint they have? What about the utilities? What about us as individual consumers? How do we gather and assimilate that data in a way? That helps us actually measure what matters. So I have a few snippets from last year's long form episode. I would encourage you to go listen to that one, but let this one be the the appetizer for you. A couple of views into how Wimbo thinks about it. First, Wimbo discusses how his company Singularity uses data to measure and reduce carbon emissions, and then the second, Wimbo discusses his. App development, his 200 iterations in founding this company called Singularity Energy, how he uses power systems expertise to make an impact in energy management. All of this led to him becoming a founder in, in a sector where he swore he would never enter into for family reasons, the power sector. And、uh, I got to say, as far as founder profiles go, Wimbo was very transparent and vulnerable about. The who, what, where, when, how, and why of founding his company, raising money. He went into great detail, and that, of course, is in the longer form episode. I hope you'll go check that out as well. We'll leave it in the comments for you to find、uh, for that to find that link. But today, we're going to dig into why Singularity Energy is helping us better understand carbon emissions and our actual carbon footprint. It really doesn't matter if we say that we're trying to reduce or decarbonize. The fossil fuel use on the grid. How do we know that it's working? When both she knows, and soon you will as well. If you love conversations like this, if this is helping you further your career or your business, and also help us accelerate the clean energy transition, then well, you're in the right place because we've got more than 650 such episodes here in the back catalog at Suncast. You can find them at mysuncast.com. For now. Let's get ready to tune up your skills, Solar Warrior, as we dig into another powerful conversation here on Suncast. Wimbo, I really appreciate you phrasing it or sort of placing that container for us because I'm certain I'm not the only one here who carries not a little bit of guilt about not knowing how to quantify my own carbon footprint when I have for 16 years shouted from the rooftops, "We need to lower our emissions. We need to use renewable sources of fuel." You're absolutely right. You're putting your finger in a sore spot for the industry, candidly, not a blind spot, but a sore spot. Would you introduce me then to Singularity Energy, the ent the entity that you created to solve this problem? Why should I, as a、uh, an observer,、uh, care that Singularity Energy exists? Yeah, let me start by telling a you know a little bit more about the background of the company, so that you will have more context of how Singularity evolved to. You know, to solve this carbon data problem, right? So, when I first started the company、uh, three or four years ago, I wasn't looking at carbon at all. 
uh, as you mentioned, you know, I have a power system background with a focus on smart grid. So initially, the idea of the company was to commercialize some of the energy management research that I did at PhD. So it was things like, you know, how to charge your battery in an optimal way to, you know, maximize your financial savings, right? So things like that. But when we started to talk to some of our early prospects, uh, maybe people like you, right? People who care about the environment, people who care about lowering their carbon emissions, they started to ask us questions like, oh, what is my carbon emissions? How does battery storage or EV charging or some of the other electrification, you know, uh, uh, technology can help me lower my emissions? So like people generally have some, you know, understanding or some assumptions that, you know, going electric is going to be beneficial for the environment. It's going to lower the emissions. But how to quantify that? Do you really, you know, understand the emission impact of those decisions, right? So those are some of the, typical questions that I got in the early stage of, uh, you know, the customer discovery process, right? And then I realized even for a PhD in the space, I didn't have good answers to those questions as well, because it may sound like a very simple question, how much is your carbon? But when you really dig deeper, it's not that so straightforward because the power that you're getting from the grid is a mix of so many different sources Right. If you have like local generation from your solar rooftop, things might be a little bit simpler because you're going to use your power and you know that's 100 percent clean. But when you're using the power from the bigger grid that is shared by millions of people. Right. And then there are so many different types of generators on the grid. Then that question becomes a little bit hard. Uh, so that's why, you know, we started to really dive deeper into the carbon space starting with the data problem, right? Like how can we really understand and tell the generation sources on the grid that is going to supply your electricity to your home, to your businesses, and then use that as a foundation for you to understand your carbon footprints or the baseline. Then it's not only about the data, right? It's like the data is only the starting point. It's only about visibility into carbon. But what is more important, how can you leverage that data to inform better decisions, to decarbonize in a better way, right? Because people normally say you can't manage something that you cannot measure, right? Measurement is the first step. Then the, right. the natural next step is that like you want to utilize those data to inform data-driven decisions, like better quantifiable decisions to really understand like what are the levers that you can take to decarbonize your businesses, your you know operations, your home, uh, so that we can accelerate the energy transition, right, to really achieve a 100% carbon-free power grid in the future. Now, for those who are looking through your LinkedIn as they're listening to this, uh, I want to kind of connect a couple of dots for folks. You have a pretty deep level of understanding and uh, and a very concrete sort of framework of research for the energy sector. You were a graduate student researcher at UCLA's Smart Grid Energy Research Center for more than four years. It was the foundational work of your doctoral degree, and you have spent your postdoctoral at Harvard University, relatively well-known institution, thinking about how to, to leverage that learning as you surveyed the landscape, I think the question that comes up for me, not knowing much about this sector, the, the measurement, the data and analysis pieces, what solutions exist today for your prospective customers? So today, when people are trying to measure or calculate their emissions, most often they're using a emission factor to translate their energy consumption or electricity consumption measured in kilowatt hours or megawatt hours into carbon. So that emission factor is a key to do the translation. And typically people are using the emission factor from EPA eGrid. And that emission factor normally is a two to three years old annual average, regional average number. So that doesn't give you what is happening on the grid more specifically, right? It's like a very rough picture. So sometimes you can think of the data that we're providing in some way similar to the weather data, 
three-year-old annual average weather data is not going to tell you anything. <laughs> I get it. Now, what yeah. needed to be true from the time that you started at UCLA in 2011, where mm -hmm. you know we both saw the solar industry start the parabolic yes. curve up and to the right, mm -hmm. what needed to be true from then to now in order for you to be able to yeah. actually extract real-time yeah, exactly. data that just wasn't possible when you and I yeah. got in this industry. Yeah, I think it was not only about the possibility, but it was also because the problem changed. The reason why that EPA EGRID number makes sense in the past was because there were not so much variations on the grid back then, right? If you rely on a 100% fossil fuel power system, then you wouldn't see too much changes in terms of carbon, right? So the reason why the problem is a different problem now is because now we have a lot of renewables on the grid. Yes. You have wind, you have solar, <laughs> and everybody knows that those resources are very fluctuating. So that's why today, if you look at the carbon intensity, uh, which is a measurement of how carbon intense, intensive your grid is, so that metric becomes much more dynamic. So... With renewable energy in particular, an intermittent resource, there are fluctuations in carbon intensity on the grid mix in a very dynamic manner. And it's different state to state, municipality to municipality, especially with co-ops and, and munis and different procurement strategies at, at each level of, of the process. So as you survey kind of the last 10 years, and we were doing a look back of like what exists today for customers that you are leapfrogging with a technological approach to solve these problems and to give them data-driven decision mm -hmm. uh, tools. But what needed to be true for your business, Singularity Energy, mm -hmm. to succeed? Like what, what happened over the last 10 years that, that gave you the, um, the tools to be able to, to do this? Yeah, I think first of all, definitely it's about data, as you said, right? Because we're a data business. We're a data analytics company, right? We need to get the inputs from the system operators, from, you know, EPA, EIA, you know, that is a foundation for us. So definitely like the increasing uh, amount of data about the grid, about emissions, those are the foundation. So today we started with public data sources as a first step, because even with public data sources, you don't have the direct carbon measurements or the direct carbon intensity metrics from those sources today. And things are changing, by the way. Yeah, things are changing because more and more people are asking for that, right? Like they're asking for, oh, what is the carbon intensity of the grid? They started to ask their utilities. They started to ask their grid operators. So that's why one of the trends that I have been, you know, I have been uh, witnessing in the past few years is like more and more people are starting to become more, uh, uh, you know, aware of the problem. Right. So so that's why, you know, like, you know, as I said, like the first step for us is to utilize those public data sources and we do the transformation. Right. So like we transform those uh, fuel mix data, the generation data coming from the grid operators, uh, combine that with the EPA emission, and, you know, emission monitoring system data to give you a pretty good uh, high resolution picture about your emissions intensity in your grid on a real time basis. But that is not the best data yeah. that you may really want. Because to Got your it. point, emissions are time dependent, but also are location dependent, right? It's like when you're talking about California, as you can probably imagine, Northern California, Southern California, pretty different, right? Like San Francisco versus Los Angeles versus San Diego, pretty different. But today you wouldn't be able to get that data because it's beyond the public domain, Right. In order to access that next level of accuracy, of reliability in the data that we provide, then you need to unlock the proprietary data from the system. And that's exactly what we're trying to do now. Uh, you know, last year, uh, we started to work with some of the utilities. One of those utilities is Eversource in the Northeastern area, right? So the idea is to try to, you know, work with them, you know, get access to the proprietary uh, information about the grid and then start generating much more uh, granular carbon intensity and, and, you know, painting that carbon picture at the local level, you know, as much as possible. Again, I want to reuse that analogy to weather data, 
right? It's like if you think about weather information, annual average, national average doesn't give you any useful information. And the same thing on the carbon side, right? If you're using a yeah. California average, probably won't matter too much if you're in a specific location, right? So that's why, you know, starting with the public data as a first step, but that's not the ideal solution. You know, we want to give you the ideal solution, which, which is going to require some of the inputs and data from the system operators and utilities. For those unfamiliar, Eversource is a major utility in the Northeast of the United States that consolidated a handful of, uh, of regulated utilities, or now is a regulated utility, in, um, in the Boston area, in Massachusetts, and Connecticut. The question I had for you, because I anticipated you talk about Eversource, is what, who do you sell to and what problems do you solve for those clients? So let's take Eversource as an example for that and what the sort of underlying business model is for Singularity Energy. So the fundamental problem that we're solving is a science problem to some extent, right? It's like, you know, how to measure carbon emissions from, you know, the power grid and how to make better decisions. Then for different specific sectors or for different specific customers, then it means different business problems, right? So for example, like for Eversource, the business problem for them is about line losses. So Eversource is a distribution utility company, which means that they don't own any generation. So when they started to look at their carbon footprint or their carbon inventory, a majority of that is due to line losses. So today, you know, like nobody has a good way of calculating the carbon emission associated with that line losses. So because, first of all, you don't have the data, right? You don't have the visibility into each lines because each lines, depending on which source that is connected to, it may have very different carbon intensity. So you can imagine if there is a transmission line connecting with a fossil fuel power plant versus a transmission line connecting with offshore wind, then from a carbon perspective, it's very different. Just so I'm clear, they don't, they don't own generation. So therefore, if they have an inefficient delivery process, and just for the sake of round numbers, let's say, you know, there's 1 million units mm -hmm. to deliver 20% of those units or 20 or 200,000 get lost in line losses. What they then need to calculate is the emissions on what was delivered and the emissions yes. on what was lost. Yes. And, mm -hmm. and that, and the, the sort of the variables around that impact, they, how they operate and how they can therefore reduce emissions. Okay. Right. And they have to report that emissions in the first place, That's right. by the way. You're right. Like the transmission distribution losses, typically it's going to be like 5% to 6% of the total energy that you, you know, uh, that, that, you, that you generate. But if you look at the absolute amount, it's huge. It's humongous. Mm -hmm. Right. Because you, know, you are using like megawatt, you know, like millions of megawatt hours every year. Right. Like six, six percent of that is huge. Right. So that's why for Eversource, the line losses, it's a major source of emissions. If you look at their sustainability reports uh, in the past few years. So that is like one of the like one of the more specific problems for utilities like Eversource to really help them understand their emissions including line losses, including some of the other emissions, right? And then to help them get a much more robust and reliable picture of that, and then use that to reduce emissions as a next step. Can I ask a question just purely from MBA and like uh, maybe even like a question my dad would ask uh, who, who is just a, a blue collar business owner. Um, great. Now I know what my emissions are. How do I justify the cost of that knowledge and how do I monetize it in a way that helps my investors know that this was a useful thing to learn? Yeah. yeah. So there are multiple ways to think about the value this uh, measurement that can bring to you as a business. So first of all, a lot of the businesses today are under pressure of ESG. Right. Like they, this is the reason why they're doing those reports. Right. So this is this to, you know, to them, this is a requirement almost. Right. It's like you have to report to your investors, to your uh, stakeholders, to your users, customers. So, so this is like already a business need for them. Right. So the problem that we're trying to solve for them in reporting is can you actually use more robust, defensible, granular numbers? so that you feel confident 
in whatever results that you generate to the, you know, to the stakeholders, because people are going to look at that carbon numbers every year and then make sure that you're actually achieving whatever commitments that you made, right? Like net zero by 2023 or carbon free whatsoever, right? You know, those uh, very ambitious decarbonization targets. And then the second one, as I said, measurement is the first step. Once you have the measurements, then you will have a much better understanding of which part of the system is more carbon intensive or those half, you know, like it's kind of like those hot spots on the maps, right? And then you will also have, be able to identify specifically where you want to prioritize, right? So that you can leverage those data and insights to inform those decisions, right? So that you can accelerate and then measure the progress against your goals so that you're using the best information to make the best decisions to accelerate that process. If you're listening to this, it's because you've made it to the end of another powerful, impactful Tactical Tuesday podcast. Listening is what has helped me grow in my career. And I just want to say thank you because I can tell that you're an infinite learner and I'm grateful that you stick around all the way to the end. And I don't know why you're still here, but I just wanted to say that you matter to me. And I would so appreciate it if you haven't already, if you would leave a review of the podcast and rate it in Spotify or Apple Podcasts, wherever you listen to your podcasts, almost every app that I'm aware of at least gives you the option to click five stars and tell the world why you think it was deserving of it. If you do believe that it's deserving of it, if you have a critique, I'd love to hear it as well. Hit me up at Nico at mysuncast.com. I always check my email to look for those kinds of feedback. If you think that you or someone you know is worthy of being on the podcast because you are a subject matter expert or you are building a company that has a story to tell, well, reach out. Nico at mysuncast.com. Happy to have that conversation with you as well. If you are just hanging out wondering if I'll mention where I can find uh, this information, like the transcript or the show notes, um, that's at mysuncast.com in the show notes or episodes tab. And that's easy to find. While you're there, you should also click on the sponsors tab because those folks help make sure that this show is free to you each and every week. So all you have to do is pay your attention and invest your time. Thank you for doing that. Please go give them a nod Check out the products that they are putting out in the world, services that are helping move the the clean energy transition forward faster and with more efficacy. I won't take up any more of your time, but I do want to say thank you. Remember, you are what you listen to. Thanks again for showing up, Solar Warrior. It's half the battle.